problem is that we working professionals have fallen off a humor cliff. So this is based on research of over 1.4 million people in 166 countries who were asked a really simple question. And that question was, did you smile or laugh a lot yesterday? What we find is at age 16, 18, 20, people are largely saying yes. And then at age 23, pretty remarkably, the answer quickly becomes no. And we don't start laughing again until we retire. So we go to work and we stop laughing. So our question became, how would our businesses and our lives change for the better if we had more joy at work? And more broadly, we wanted to answer the question, how would our world change for the better if each of us navigated our lives on the precipice of a smile? When is just the ROI on humor? You know, you think of humor as this incredibly soft, intangible thing, but there is a significant ROI on humor. It has a meaningful and substantive impact on many of the dependent variables that we look at um, from a business perspective. So for example, leaders with a sense of humor, any sense of humor, not even a good sense of humor, are in fact 27% more motivating and inspiring. Their employees are 15% more engaged when they work with them, and their teams are twice as creative um, as measured by solving a creativity challenge. When people laugh before they try and do that, they're far more effective. And if you don't care about being motivating or admired or having functional creative teams, then you might enjoy knowing that it will make you wealthier. Our favorite studies show that in negotiations, if you simply add a, sing, a simple lighthearted line to the end of a sales pitch, like, this is my final offer and I'll throw on my pet frock, you actually get people, consumers, that say that they would be much more likely to pay for it, 18% higher price points. And they say that they enjoy the negotiation much more. And that was basically a bad dad joke that got the 18% higher price point. So we often think of humor as this one thing, you put it in your backpack, you either bring it to work with you or you don't. And in fact, we know that there are these four styles. Each of us is naturally inclined to one or two of these styles. And we can also flex our style based on the context so that we can use humor more adeptly and more effectively at work. So those four styles, by the way, you're gonna get quizzed on what your style is after, uh, after I share them, are the stand-up, the sweetheart, the sniper, and the magnet. One of the things that the, this you know, typology does is it illuminates the natural risks that people feel um, or experience oftentimes when they do deploy humor in a work setting. So for example, stand-ups, they tend to tease others almost as a sign that I like you. So kind of teasing equals intimacy. Um, now, for an audience who doesn't really necessarily know that or has a different humor style, it can actually offend. So that directness could hurt feelings um, and they're more prone to make jokes that others might think are completely off limits. Now the sweetheart, remember they're earnest and they're un understated, um, but they're so focused oftentimes on lifting others that they can over-index on self-deprecation. At higher levels of status, self-deprecation is a really powerful tool, but at lower levels, it can actually boomerang. Then the snipers, their observational humor can often mm, fail to take into context, you know, emotional or interpersonal um, factors. And so therefore they also are at a higher risk of potentially offending. Also, because their laughter is sparse, right? You know, when you make a sniper laugh, you feel great, but it doesn't happen often. Um, withholding it can often signal that they don't appreciate humor in the workforce, even though they might. And lastly, the magnet. Their spontaneity can often lead to not really thinking through the natural consequences of what they're about to say, and the overuse of humor sometimes could be seen as frivolous or time-wasting. So what we find is that in order to use humor authentically at work, you need to better understand not just what your own humor style is, what the humor style is of your team, because then you garner greater empathy and you understand where they're coming from to a far greater degree, but you also need to understand the risks associated with these different types of humor. You never use humor again. Ever. Just, Ever. Just, and then you, yeah, then you die. <laughs> Sorry, too dark. Did I go too dark? And that's our book about humor. Thanks for watching. <laughs>
there are a couple of reasons why we tend to fail uh, with humor in the workplace. So understanding these reasons will help us avoid them. Number one is the rule in comedy, never punch down. And that's that you never wanna make fun of someone of lower status than you. Uh, now, this is particularly important for leaders, right? Because as we rise in the ranks of an organization, our playing field for humor is actually narrowing. So our senior leaders have to recognize that while self-deprecation wasn't a tool that they used very well early in their career, it now can be a superpower for them as leaders. So as Jennifer mentioned, magnet and sweetheart style humor, the styles that tend to over-index on self-deprecation, now those styles are real superpowers for leaders. Um, another one is context switching. Now it goes without saying that um, humor is incredibly context dependent, that as you said, the jokes that work in the living room aren't necessarily, aren't necessarily gonna land in the boardroom. But in that moment, when you think of something funny, it can be really tempting to just want to have it come out um, at work, we tell our students, keep it PG-13. Um, you know, if it's not in Jumanji or kindergarten cop uh, growing up, then don't, you know, just don't take the risk at work. Um, we also talk about reading the room. And so we share a story in the book of a CEO who, after letting one of his senior leaders from the organization go, he walked into the room and he made an insensitive joke about her departure. Now, he recognized that that was coming from a place of his own discomfort, that he wanted to diffuse tension in the room, and his way of doing that was to make a joke. If he had taken a moment to recognize what was really going on for him, to read the room and the context, and have some, you know, a moment of empathy for those in the room, then he never would have made that joke. And so part of this, too, is not just about being funny. It's about being more human, being more connected to our colleagues, and recognizing uh, not whether or not what I say is going to make people think I'm funny, but how is it going to make them feel when it lands on them?